Coming up next on this special joint production of Arizona Horizon and Horizonte, a documentary that explores the legacy of hate in America and what it means today, and a discussion about the challenges of race relations today, both in Arizona and across the country. That's all coming up on Arizona Horizon and Horizonte. Arizona Horizon and Horizonte are made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to this special joint production of Arizona Horizon and Horizonte. I'm Jose Cardenas. Memorials and services have begun for some of the dozens of victims who were killed in last weekend's mass shootings in Dayton, Ohio and El Paso, Texas. In El Paso, a gunman opened fire on a Walmart, killing 22 and injuring dozens. Another nine people were killed in Dayton, Ohio after a shooting in an entertainment district. President Trump visited both cities yesterday to visit survivors and to talk to first responders. In remarks at the White House on Monday, the president condemned the hatred that led to the shootings. In one voice, our nation must condemn racism, bigotry, and white supremacy. We have asked the FBI to identify all further resources they need to investigate and disrupt hate crimes and domestic terrorism. The El Paso shooter may face hate crime charges after a multi-page manifesto written by the suspect outlining his hatred of Hispanics and immigrants was posted online. The motive for the Dayton shooter is less clear, with investigators focusing on the suspect's obsession with violent ideologies. American Hate is a documentary that explores the growing climate of hate in the United States and what it means in the country today. The film is part of the Carnegie Night News 21 project entitled Hate in America, which received the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award and the student Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Digital Reporting. You will have the opportunity to watch the documentary in a moment, and afterwards, we'll have a discussion about race relations in Arizona and across the country. A warning, the video contains violent imagery, which may be disturbing to some viewers. Knowing that, Lord, because we're standing on your will, every form of evil that is set against us shall not prosper. That those that seek and hunger for righteousness shall be filled. So we pray this right now, Lord, that we just come and we just want to see this country right. We want to see American and the next generations to know that we stood here today so that they could be free. We ask that you guide our steps, you guide our thoughts, you guide our words. Knowing that, Lord, through your uh, uh, righteousness becomes victory, Father. And we honor you by standing up and having will in the hunger for righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I think the violence from slavery to Jim Crow to what's happening today is a manifestation of our history that has not really, in some way, really been dealt with in a way to heal this, this separation that was caused by slavery. Uh, because the relationship between black and white in the South especially came out of separation instead of unification. And I think that's what we're still dealing with today. Do we see each other as human beings or do we see each other still by this, by skin color? And the violence comes from how, the perception of how we look at each other. You know what I mean? Why should I, as a black man, be seen as a threat just because of the color of my skin? But that is not necessarily the color of my skin, it's the history behind that that makes all the difference in the war. And that's how lynching uh, was created to keep blacks in their place. when it took place is where the mob or the people decided they were the judge, jury, and executed beyond the law. If race didn't matter, I don't think it would have happened. If you didn't have um, slavery or whatever it is, right, in Jim Crow, uh, you wouldn't, to me, it wouldn't really matter. But I know race always plays a factor in everything. Over 4,000 lynching 
That's a lot of people. That's a lot of death. But each individual that have died, men and women and children, left somebody that's still here generations later. What are they grappling with? I did not know that people were mean enough to want to kill a whole family, including children. There were people that hated daddy because he was black and he wanted black folks to vote. They came that night, a group of cowards, to kill the whole family. On January the 10th, around 2 o'clock that morning before they, they came in and hit us. And you could see fire coming in through the living room. And I yelled to him to get up. I believe they got us this time. And they did have us this time. My daddy was shooting out of the window in his bedroom across the gar garage. When she turned around to get me, I was no longer where she had left me. I had gone to where my daddy was to see who he was shooting at. As she went away from the window, the window came down and closed and she could not open it back up. She had to take her shoulder and physically knock the window out. I hit the window so hard with my shoulder that I fell on out with the sash. And the next thing, Bruno was handing Betty out the window to me. And we were able to escape. I thought that we were all going to die in the house. I thought we were going to get uh, burned up in the house. That night, we just simply went across the field because it's always been a garden. There was a road that ran through here to this barn, and this is where we sought refuge to get out of the light that night as the store burned and the house burned. My dad and I sat together, and I was crying and because I was in excruciating pain because of the burns that I had received. But Daddy was there beside me, and he never complained. He never said anything, uh, even though the skin on him was literally hanging off like a sheet of paper. He never complained. I hated all white people. Once I found out what happened, my mother being the person that she is, explained to me that all white people didn't do this. And they made a decision just before he died that they would have to let 18 people who had tried to register vote would not have to come back to the courthouse to try to register again. They would have to send them that voter registration card. His came in the mail after we buried him. We were just sad because we know he never would vote when they opened the museum. I cried. I did pretty good till I got to, when we finally got to the bullets in that truck, it brought to me back what happened that night. I felt hurt that America would let this happen to you. Because America could have stopped it. If you can go to foreign countries, and help those countries, you certainly could have stopped the Klan in Mississippi if they had wanted to. They didn't see the need to stop them. The Klan was still all over Mississippi, all over the South, some, but in small numbers, there ain't many of them, and they have no kind of influence on nobody. And they're afraid to, to, to attack us because, no, we're not, we're gonna, we're not gonna turn the other cheek. Medgar was my brother. He was the head of the NACP. He was killed by one of the most crazy racist white men who thought he stopped the movement, and he just inspired it. See, what white folks didn't realize that the more you kill one, the better it made the movement for us. Man, this is his, his driveway. When I came in that night, my house was full of people. What are y'all doing in my house? I don't know about my house. I said, Charles, they shot Medgar. I said, they can't kill him ever. We don't die. He said, no, Charles, he's dead. And when I went in there, Merlin was sitting there crying, his wife. I said, Merlin, don't cry, honey. I said, I'm going to get even with him. She said, Charles, no. I said, yes, I am. I'm going to get even with all these crackers for killing my brother. The next day, I was in Metka's office. And it looked just like Metka walked through that door and said, Charles, no. Do it the way I was doing. Get the color folks registered and vote, and vote them out. I realized killing wasn't the answer. And that's what changed it. Because everything what he was doing was aggravating and making a lot of folks mad. Fighting to get black folk equal to everyone else. Independently, financially, and every other way. And I began to do that. I don't want Mecca to ever be forgotten. What he did, how he made us get to where we are today because of his effort. Before him, there was none trying. It's gonna take time to get the hate out. You don't hate people because of the color of their skin. 
This used to be a surrogated country, period. Black over here and white over here, period. America only, America ever owed us was the right to be free and equal. I don't know if that will happen or not. I think we, we come to the point where we can be accepted. And being equal, we're not equal nowhere. In this country right now, we have hate. The Klan uh, influences are still present today. We're talking about legacies. All legacies are good and bad, but legacies are far-reaching. America still has not faced up to its racism and repudiated it once and for all. People are understanding that uh, the climate in America now must be uh, challenged uh, if we are to have peace from within. The Ku Klux Klan was right there in my backyard. I was born into a, a family that was very dysfunctional, alcoholic father that was very violent. He would take, you know, come in in drunken rage and take a butcher knife and cut your mattresses up, you know, all the mattresses in the house. Uh, tear up uh, furniture, there wouldn't be any furniture left standing upright. And I grew up, you know, actually with no self-esteem. I was angry, didn't like myself, didn't like anyone else. And I was looking for, you know, looking for something to fit into another family. I went to a Klan rally in Chipolo, Mississippi. The Imperial Wizard was there, different leaders, and that's when a lot of them put their arm around me and said, we'll take you and take care of you. We know you had a hard life. I fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. See, they think they're sanctified by God to commit these acts of violence in anything they do. So it was after I got in that, uh, I, you know, I, I kind of found out. But from the time I joined, I felt a, you know, immediate feeling of importance. And then I had twin boys, and one of my twin boys was starting to, to pick up on what I was doing and following in my footsteps. He was influenced by me. I would criticize him if he talked about bringing a, a friend home from school that was it was black or or Mexican or anything of that you know of any, they, they just wasn't white. Used to ride around with the Confederate flag, you know, in, in an all-black apartment complex, and you know to provoke. It was wrong, you know. They got three options: when they join the Klan, they can maybe come to their senses and back out before they get too deep. Two, they can go to jail. And that happens a lot. Three, they end up dead. I see white supremacy raising itself up. I think we're, we're dealing with a lot of things from the past that are starting to come to the surface, like what happened in Charlottesville. And that, to me, it's something that we can't ignore it. It doesn't go away, it's in your bones. You know, people feel that in many ways. Some people left because of it. But people who have to still live here have to grapple with that. And people want some healing. They want some freedom. You know, I mean, they're tired. We don't want to repeat that history all over again. We want to change the tapestry of this country, to me, in a way that, that frees people from this, this wound, this shackle that's still with us. You can never forget what we drove up on. We drove up on a body that had the left shoulder and the head missing. You could see where there was a trail in this road, and the trail went from one side of the road to the other side of the road. Thought maybe it was a tire that was canted a little bit and was leaving rubber in the road. But once we got to looking, you realized that it wasn't rubber that was in the road. It was meat and flesh and blood. And with this long trail that we followed for a couple miles was actually part of a human being. You could see around the man's ankles that it was, you could tell he had been tied around the ankles. And we just started putting things together. They made an announcement in church. They told all the members to stay in your home, stay locked up, because uh, there was an unknown body found in the road. We don't know what's going on in Jasper. And so uh, it was a scary moment. Uh, but then at the same time, we realized 
you know, what happened, then you, you can't come to reconciliation in your mind. To hear how he died and, and they had the change came loose, uh, they had opportunity to do the right thing, uh, but instead they had a mission, they tied him right back up to the truck and continued to uh, drag him and left his body in front of Black Cemetery. And never my wildest dream, I thought that she was killed in that way. I had never been a part of anything to where you, you saw the results of pure hate. Uh, I didn't know people thought the way some people think to kill somebody, to tie them to a truck and drag them for three miles with a chain. It's so far over my head. There's so much hate that's involved in that that it was, it's just kind of uncomprehendable f to me. And when I walked in to, to tell the family, they, Papa Bird, Mama Bird, they already knew. But we all cried together. We all prayed together. And I made Mr. Bird a promise that we wasn't gonna quit till we got the people in jail. When this case came up, the chief of police back in that day said, you're, you're going to ruin your career. You need to plea bargain this case. So you're, you're talking about a country sheriff and a country DA uh, going against all tradition. We were doing what we were doing because it was the right thing to do, not because it was politically right to do it. It was pretty obvious the guy was being drugged behind this truck. We started finding pieces of evidence, started finding all kinds of cigarette lighter. And on this cigarette lighter, there was an inverted sign that we didn't know what it meant. It turned out to be an inverted Ku Klux Klan emblem. They were in a Klan group called Confederate Knights of America. And it's primarily a prison Klan group. Sean Allen Berry confessed to the district attorney and I at about three o'clock in the morning. He said that they went to F with an N and it got out of control. East Texas is very much the South. It's very much like Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama. The, the old racial history uh, was full of lynchings and killings. When, when I grew up, uh, the community was very much segregated. They had white bathrooms and colored bathrooms and colored drinking fountains, and it was very much segregated. We didn't have hate crimes then. It was not the word terminology, hate crime. But I knew that there was a civil rights violation because they deprived him of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness because of his color. That's a federal crime. So I go to the FBI because I needed help. This country sheriff was in a bind, but it turned out that it, it was not a, a federal offense. And we prosecuted him in state court along with the U.S. Attorney's Assistant. We did what we had to do to solve a murder case. It just happened that it was a black guy that was murdered and three idiot white people that murdered him. Sitting in that courtroom, it was very tense. It was very divisive. It, it was very, very uh, unsettling, to say the least. To sit in the courtroom and, and watch that. Uh, we had division within the community and, and, and that fear within the community just got worse because uh, the long shadow of slavery still exists in our nation. It was not a very good time in this community. And we know right now by looking at our nation that instead of coming together, we're kind of pulling apart. But to watch the family, Mr. and Mrs. Jane Bird, the mother and father, they had such grace. They had such forgiveness. The Bird family, to me is one of the best examples of how you deal with a situation like this with dignity. I'm sure they were angry. I'm sure they were just grief stricken. 
they were a marvelous example of how you deal with something like this in a very dignified way, and a way that really, I think, promoted justice being done. You know, this is the first time in the state of Texas that a white man's given the death penalty for killing a white man. And it happened in a part of the state that's known for its racial history, and that's why. I think America is divided now. We have a long way to go to come to that conclusion that we've got to get better before it get worse. Because if it get worse, then America will not be land of free anymore. These things happen, and then life goes on, and we forget about them. And we can't ever forget that stuff like this happens. 20 years is not that long ago, and they'll happen again if we don't continue to remember them. The fact that you know, there were three people who did that, and that doesn't reflect all of Jasper. But racism, I'm told, still exists in Jasper. I think racism exists everywhere, and I don't think Jasper's any exception. I think one of the most egregious examples of racism happened in Jasper. That doesn't mean that everybody in Jasper is a racist, but it does mean that it can happen anywhere. I was delivering my first order with DoorDash to Rick Painter straight collared, looked like a supervisor at a restaurant, Caucasian, 54-year-old, 200-pound, six-foot-two man. I went up the steps and he, he was, had the door wide open. He was like, yeah, just put the food on the table. He's sitting in his recliner on his phone, you know. He's like, uh, did you get the tip? I tipped you five dollars on the app. I was like, well, no, but look, just do me a favor, contact DoorDash so that way you can get your tip back. He's like, listen, I'm, I'm in the tipping business, you know, I'm gonna, t I'm gonna tip you in cash, you know. So he was like, let me get my wallet. While he's going to his wallet, he's like, oh, and by the way, I'm Jesus. I'm walking toward the door, but this was going this way. And I'm getting pulled back in. He's trying to choke me with my clothes. And the abaya that I, well, the, the jabal that I had on, it was, it was choking me. I seen what I thought was a, a Swiss Army knife. I thought he was gonna grab it and try to stab me with it. So I grabbed it. And I was like, please, sir, just let me go. I got kids, you know, I got kids. Come on, I got kids. There's no way that I would have been strong enough to just naturally get out of that without anything next to me. God calmed him down. He said, if I let you go, are you gonna get the H out of my house right now? I got my stuff and I left. I didn't know how messed up I was. It's a lot going on as far as um, things that used to be normal is not normal anymore. I'm just trying to act normal. Stevie Wonder could tell that that was a hate crime. You could see it without even being able to see. That's how much of a hate crime it was. I don't care about race. And I think he did. And then not only the fact that I'm African American, but this is on my face. I made it specifically clear when I was in that house that I was going to do everything I could not to kill this man. I could have killed him, but I didn't because I'm Muslim. You are not gonna see the end of this type of discrimination against Muslims uh, or other minorities inside this country. And again, it's not only against Muslims, we also see this now expanded into immigrants, into Latinos, into many other groups are now being targeted as well. Latinos were always identified as being the racial group with the least power. One of the most recent incidents was a Honduran immigrant woman who was stabbed multiple times and then burned in her apartment by somebody she had met online. She was from Honduras. She was a young Latina immigrant girl who was kind-hearted and just a beautiful person all around. Again, it wasn't that she was just stabbed, but she was also set on fire. Basically, we were her family, so we had to fight with the police, we had to fight with the consulate, we had to raise money to send her a body. Many of the hate crimes that get reported targeting that community, the majority of them are Latina immigrants and transgender women. All of those coming together, I think, have made them unfortunate targets. And I know, just by talking to those communities, that there are so many more incidents that they're not even reporting because the sense that somehow this is typical. 
We as trans Latinas specifically, every single day, we are verbally assaulted in some kind of way. So to us, that's not new. However, when it comes to physical aggression, I think that's something that has been increasing more since the recent election and the recent administration. It seems like people got permission to be who they truly are. Everybody is expected to have black pride, Jewish pride, Hispanic pride, even gay pride. But for some reason, if you express white pride, that's, you're going to be a bad guy. That's, somehow that's hate. The original Knights of America, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, has never been involved in a violent act. I can say that uncategorically and for the record. I mean, the Klan started out simply as a social club. The blacks and the East Indians, American Indians, Orientals, we were all created by God, but he created us different for a reason. There's a lot of groups that look out for their own. They're not labeled hate groups. There are groups out there that are opposed to the Klan, whether it's the Southern Poverty Law Center or the Anti-Defamation League or the NAACP, I might add. These groups, generally speaking, are not going to give you an objective view of the Klan. They have one agenda, and that's against the Klan. The stereotype of the Klan as a backward, ignorant redneck who's bent on violence, wants to go out and whoop niggers and all. Listen, we're not about that. That's, if you want to be in something like that, go to Hollywood. The Klan won't get anywhere until it gets away from this ignorant redneck image. We're not in it to hate anybody. We're in it to look out for our own. Not to tear anybody down, but to preserve what's ours. I was thinking about the, the possibility of a future as a minority, and it, it's absolutely uh, not one that I look forward to. So Identity Europa was founded by Nathan D'Amigo in uh, May of 2016. It was founded to be an American identitarian organization. So identitarian uh, refers to, identitarianism rather, is a way of seeing the world that emphasizes identity, right? The role that identity plays um, in, in group dynamics, on an individual level, and so forth too. Despite some of the controversy and taboo relating to our ideas, uh, you know, it is a very positive thing, and people that join Identity Europa end up uh, becoming better people in the process. We're promised this, you know, this great future, this rainbow future, where everybody across the entire world can come to a nation, specifically this nation in America. And, you know, they're, they're just as American as, as you or I. All they have to do is accept our values. Well, at this point, we can't even agree on what those values actually are. You have basically sections of cities or sections of areas that they for a very large part are self-segregated. That's the reason you have a Chinatown. Nobody's forcing these people to live together. They want to be with people most like them. Genetically, uh, culturally, they speak the same language. It's an advantage for them to do that. It's not hateful at all to stand up for your people and to speak on white interests, whereas all the other racial groups are able to do it, and it's not called hate. For us, it's, it's a completely different world. We're the National Socialist Movement. Um, we don't prefer uh, neo-Nazi, you know, because neo is new. There's nothing really new about it. And Nazi is a buzzword, you know, we're National Socialists. But we're a white civil rights organization. You know, since I've been in charge of the organization, I want to change with the time. We have to be realistic. In 2008, we changed the uniform. In 2016, we changed our symbolism as well. One of the reasons why you know, we went away from the swastika too is because people would, say, people would tell us, we like the economic platform. We like, everything you're saying is so rational, it sounds so good, but the swastika, you know, it just, it was too much for some people. No matter what side you agree with, and no matter how you look at it, our freedoms are being eroded away. And today, it might be national socialists, white nationalists that are being persecuted. Tomorrow, it may be Vietnam veterans. We don't want to see a bloody revolution in this country, but if a race war or, or uh, economic collapse happens in this country, our people are better prepared for it than anybody else.
right, so we're all Western chauvinists here, right? And as a Western chauvinist, we pride ourselves in being Western civilized. We are not savages, we are not animals, we are fucking men. But at the same time, on top of being men, we are fucking gentlemen, all right? So I don't want you guys going in there starting shit, nothing dumb like that, because that's not us, that's what Antifa does. We're there to stand for our ground and stand for our rights. Freedom of speech, Second Amendment, et cetera, and whatnot. We all know our uh, The amendment. Proud Boys is an interesting and confusing group. They're very, they're high energy. Um, they like to have a lot of fun. They like to party. Uh, they're very passionate about America and freedom. Hey, you want some tequila? They found a way to build a brotherhood and a family. Uh, something I think that a lot of men don't have in this country. The leaders of the group, I see them give speeches to people who are going to enter into it, new guys. Um, and they constantly give the speeches about, if this isn't about race, this isn't about anything, it's about your country, it's about freedom, and it's about family. So there's been several rallies where there's no violence or Antifa didn't show up, and it's just a fun, great experience, right? We would have speeches, music, have a good time, um, and just really focus on the message. And then we started getting calls from people that were being assaulted. Elderly people, elderly vets, disabled vets, you know, younger people being spit on and assaulted by people that just because they had this, you know, dissenting views. And people were, we were one of the only people that step up and put ourselves between those people. And we'll do it till the day I take my last breath. And the rock is The rock is I don't know what it is, but freedom to me is so sexy. It's beautiful. It's something that we need to cherish and, and take care of. We should be looking inward because we have so many problems, homeless, you know, issues. You know, so, so many uh, children with 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 father in fatherless homes and stuff like that. Like, there's so much unrest in our country alone. I don't think it should be a priority for us to be looking outward towards other countries because that's you know, as harsh as it sounds, that country should be handling that. People shouldn't be afraid to say, hey, I voted for Trump. You know, we can disagree, but we can talk about it. People won't even talk about it because they're so scared about the reaction of coming out on who they voted for, what they believe. Obviously, the streets is the more wild side of Patriot Prayer. It's a very important part, too. We complain so much about um, how hard it is today, and people are too afraid. They're afraid of being doxxed, or they're afraid of this, or they're afraid of losing their job. It's like these guys were like put everything on the line, you know, to grant us the freedoms that we have today. So. This is the Portland Police Bureau. The permit for this march has been revoked. Clear the streets to get onto the sidewalk. In 2008, a few things happened all at once. Number one, the Great Recession. Number two, you had the first African-American becoming the president of the United States, and another person who's now our current president basically tried to disqualify that person, saying, you know, he's not American, and actually he might be a secret Muslim. Now those racists are, feel emboldened. They feel they have carte blanche because the supreme leader of the country has more or less um, given given them his blessing. Whether he, meant, whether he meant to or not, I'm not saying he's a racist. I'm just saying some of his words are interpreted as such that people who, who have that feel interpret him that way and they go out and act upon them. August 12th in Charlottesville, Virginia was the equivalent of some kind of war zone. There were snipers on roofs all around the park. There were blockades, police cars, there were all kinds of tanks in this overly militarized police presence. There were just gangs of, of white supremacists roving together, yelling and chanting with flags and shields and sticks. They were here to 
to yell, they were here to fight, they were here to kill. And all of those things happened. Charlottesville itself is a democratic bastion, all right? 80% of the presidential vote here uh, went in favor of Hillary Clinton. Because these Confederate monuments were put up in the 1920s as segregation laws were going into place. And these monuments helped to anchor whites-only parks after black people had been uh, summarily uh, removed. About 2,000 people that know nothing about this town and all they came for is just pure hate for people they don't even know. This is seared into the collective uh, memory and psyche, you know, of the town. We've been traumatized. Everybody has. Some people are still suffering, still having surgeries, uh, still needing uh, psychiatric care. I have a picture uh, that was taken in a split second by a photographer with Heather looking right at the guy before he hits her. She had originally not intended to come, and she and Justin were watching the footage of Friday night's uh, torch rally that her friend Courtney had taken, and she said to Justin, I have to go. And he said, well, don't go, it's not safe. And she said, well, I know I could die, but I have to go. I can't not stand with my friends on this. This is too important. We need to let people know that we're not happy that uh, these other people are coming again. But on the other hand, I don't think I took the whole thing seriously either. I don't think I believed that they were any more than a bunch of buffoons coming into town. You will not replace us! You will not replace us! There were only about 20 of them, maybe two dozen. You know, and they were around the side. They'd heard that these people were coming. They also, they knew, they, you know, got the memo, the proverbial memo, you know, six hours advance, you know. The, uh, the students and the community members came here, uh, you know, with a banner that said Virginia Students Against White Supremacy. And they, and they stood here around the circle, or, or you know, in a circle around the, the Jefferson Monument on the night of Friday, uh, August the 11th, you know, again, to hold space. You will not replace us, you will not erase us. Uh, we're fastly becoming a minority in the country that we founded, and yet we're still not being able to have the same rights of assembly and organization that other groups are. There was one guy with the swastika flag last year, and I am eternally going to have to pay for that one guy. We won't allow them to commandeer our public spaces uh, and uh, advocate for their hate without some vocal and visible expression of dissent. These people uh, were shouting anti-white ethnic slurs. They were robbing people of Confederate flags and torching them in front of us. They were spraying them with lighter fluid. They were going to light, you know, at the last possible second, someone grabbed the torch. He stalked those guys and bashed a guy over the face with um, a mag light. You know, a number of my students and community members were, were assaulted. People were throwing rocks at cars. Course, many of them were coming open carrying. People were shaking cars. They said this was a free speech rally. It was never meant to be such. What was supposed to be their crowning moment, you know, of uniting the right uh, turned out to be their water. Nobody tells, you know, those who marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge with Martin Luther King that they did the wrong thing, you know. And this was the Edmund Pettus Bridge of 2017. I was so eat up with, with anger and, and hatred of just everyone. But the whole time that I was in there, there was always this little bitty voice in the back of my mind that said, do you really believe the things you're doing? And, and I'm sure Becky, Becky had something to do with that, you know. And when I opened my eyes for the first time, I saw Becky. When he was born, she told me I had to take care of the children. So I just, they had me Scott. And he mine. Because when he got grown, he was a grown man and he had gotten mad and went on out by his business. So we wasn't having the business. We lost the connection of, of being close. He said he followed what he thought. He didn't have no right direction. He followed what he thought was going to make him prosper or whatever you call it. 
So he joined the clan and said they gave him some clothes and made him a big guy. I was in Nashville, Tennessee at a restaurant and I'd been eating and having dinner and drinking too. And I, left, I had left that restaurant and got pulled over by the police. That threw me into the court system. You know, I had a black lawyer and I knew when he found out my past, I was fried. He wasn't gonna, you know, wouldn't defend me or, or do, the, do the job he was supposed to do, but I was wrong. He did, he stood up and fought heads and tails for me. I just never had any kind of negative or adverse problems with Scott. When individuals would, would uh, ask me, how can you represent him? That's my job. These are human beings that are going through problems. I didn't have friends on, on the, this side because they didn't, they didn't want to have anything to do with me because I'd gotten involved with the Klan and white supremacist movement. And I sure didn't have any friends from this side, the white supremacist movement, because I was a white traitor and everything like that. And I was out here, you know, actually in the world by myself and depressed, didn't know what I was gonna do. Daryl extended his hand and we became friends and actually became brothers. Scott Shepard is a wonderful uh, individual. Uh, Scott Shepard is also my brother. I consider him a brother, he is family. When someone leaves an organization of hate, if that's what they have engaged in, I feel good for them. Not so much for myself, but for them, because now they're starting a new life. They're beginning to see things they otherwise would never have seen. When two enemies are talking, they're not fighting. They're talking. They might be yelling and screaming. They might be pounding their fists on the table to, to drive home a point, but at least they're talking. It's when the conversation ceases that the ground will become fertile, fertile for violence. We are a great country, but we fall short of complete greatness when we, when we don't take accountability for our mistakes and to address you know, certain wrongs. But I went to the Alcohol Drug Treatment Center, which was Cumberland Heights in Nashville, and I went in one person and came out another. I walked out with a different look, outlook on life and really realized that the problem was not people above the color, religion, sexual preferences, anything. The problem was me, Scott. But it was at that period of time, 91 and 92, I was trying to break away. I had decided to get away from that life with the young kids and explain to them my story. I try to tell them, and I think it's very important for them to think for themselves. Don't let anyone think for you. Think for yourselves. Yeah, he, he, he has a past. Everybody's got a past. Um, but he has, he has really, truly changed. And for that, I'm, I'm proud of him. Because like I said, I, it, I changed myself, you know. It was a wrong way of living life. So I went to Becky's house there in Indianola and knocked on the door and I said, Becky, it's me, Scott. And not only did she open the door, she opened her arms and her heart and, and, and grabbed me and I knew I was home then. She really played the biggest part in me, you know, changing back to, to who I really was. Have I totally forgiven myself? No. Will I ever? I don't think so. I try, but I just don't think so. That hatred that was sort of hidden beneath the surface is more prevalent than ever. There's a lot to be proud about America, but there's a lot to be ashamed about America. If you spend just five minutes with your worst enemy, I will guarantee you that you will find something in common. Let's stop hating and do unto others, and you have them done to you, that's all I ask. We need a better world.